of Race Relations has stated that last week's budget speech by Finance Minister Praveen Godan is uh, indicative of a government at the brink of fiscal catastrophe and without a plan for either growth or austerity. It also says that government has come close to maxing out the revenue it can extract from the economy but has no workable plan to create new revenue. To talk more about this is uh, Gwen Nguenya, and she's the Chief Operating Officer at uh, the Institute of Race Relations. Good to have you here on the program. Welcome Thank to Morning Live. Me. I think when people automatically hear Institute of Race Relations, they talk, uh, we automatically think we're going to be talking about a race issue yes. as opposed to an economic issue. Just, you know, before we talk in that, your, your stance and sort of this is a very scathing uh, report and statement that's come out from the International Relations. Yes. relations. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, just briefly, when the Institute was founded in around 1926, the goal was always to provide political and economic research that would undermine the justification of the apartheid state. So to explain using credible and you know, researched evidence why the apartheid state was not viable. So economic research has always been part of, of what we do. Okay. And the report is so scathing because we think it's important to highlight that, you know, to highlight basically the shortcomings of this particular report, especially when so many have come out in a slightly more favorable fashion. Um, and essentially, the reason why we say what we do is that the, there, has, there hasn't really been a clear outline of any reduction in, in, in basically in fiscal spending. And the projections that the minister provided about um, a declining budget deficit are really based on really optimistic growth figures. And if we look historically in terms of what the Treasury has always announced at, in their budget speech about projected growth, they've always tended to be too optimistic. And the actual results always undershoot the projected figures. So if this continues to be the trend, and there's every reason to believe that it will, then we will undershoot on our growth figures, meaning that Obviously, expenditure will make up a greater percentage of um, GDP, etc., and we think that that continues to place us at quite a precarious position. I mean, maybe to relate it also to an international context, a budget deficit of around 3.1% or above 3.1%, which is what we currently have, wouldn't qualify us to be a member of the Eurozone. So if we're looking at, I mean, all the, in terms of the criteria to qualify as countries who are part of the Eurozone, that's one of the figures. Now, of course, we're not in Europe, but it's just to give an example of what other nations consider to be fiscally prudent, and we're not yeah. currently within those boundaries. I mean, what are the other things is that you say, uh, and, and I think you, you kind of give the, the fuel levy as an example, it's almost trying to um, extract blood from a stone. Yes, I think those exactly. are the words that you yes. use. I think I understand what you're trying to say there, is that yes. how much more can you expect South Africans to keep on paying? But, I mean, you explain it to me. What, what are you getting at with that? Well, really, that you're squeezing and what exactly ours were an overbled tax base. So you have consumers who already household debt is already um, more than 50% of household expenditure. So South Africans are heavily in, in credit indebted already, and that uh, indicates that they whatever they receive in income is not enough to finance their expenditure. So on top of that, you're now adding increased tax while it's only at the top bra bracket, there is a good case we made about bracket creep. That's just the fact that when inflation increases and if your salary is in line with inflation, you will tend to move up to the next tax bracket. So really everyone is affected by any kind of tax increase, even if it's currently at a bracket above yours. At any point when you do reach it, you will be paying more than you, than you, you know, towards taxes than you currently are. So mm -hmm. that's a point of concern. Yeah. And the other point that we want to make is that really... People shouldn't view the budget as some kind of reactionary statement merely responding to current economic conditions. It does have a principled or ideological underpinning. And both the President and the State of the Nation address, as well as the Finance Minister, made sort of indications towards the National Development Plan. And they would believe lies the problem in that the state increasingly views itself as the you know, the primary consumer and the primary producer of goods in the economy. So it's taking away money from the consumer because it believes it can allocate it better through procurement deals, etc. And it's also trying to compete the private sector when you hear, um, you know, suggestions of a state bank and an increasing role for the state, the mining sector. And just recently, actually, I believe it was an SABC or SFM interview where I heard Sihle Zigalala, who's the chairperson of the ANC in, um, in KwaZulu-Natal, also speaking about a state pharmaceutical company. So yeah. there's clearly lots of talk around um, you know, the general party about increasing state influence and being in competition with the private sector. And we believe this is the wrong view to take. Um, just to 
in terms of to point out who we do think has a right idea on this is in 2015 the Reserve Bank Governor, he was speaking at a FDISA collective bargaining conference and he actually made an excellent point about the role of macroeconomic policy. He made the point that really the role of macroeconomic policy, of which fiscal policy is a part, is to really provide a solid foundation for the private sector to drive growth. Mm. Now this would seem to be at odds with our fiscal, I mean although maybe that's what the Reserve Bank Governor is articulating in terms of money policy, fiscal policy is also part of the broader macroeconomic policy stable. Yeah. And we sort of see then fiscal policy being at odds with what the Reserve Bank is saying should be the role of macroeconomic policy. Just one final question before I, before I let you know go, because I know you, you're making so many interesting points here. Yes. But just in terms of, of, of spending and bad spending when it comes to our taxes, because at the heart of all of this, it seems that that's the way, that's what's happening, is that uh, different departments are not spending our money wisely and it's not going uh, to the right causes although you see massive budgets for instance education I mean it always takes the the biggest um, bit of our budget towards it and I mean, we're talking billions upon billions there's a five yes. billion rand increase uh, to the budget in education and yet we are still seeing pupils sitting under trees in mud schools with no toilet facilities no computers no textbooks i mean these are things that 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 really hit badly your view on government spending yeah i mean you make an excellent point um, as to higher education i mean that's been historically underfunded so i think we would support um any in increase injection towards the higher education sector, especially because of the lack of skills um, in education. But basic education, I think our expenditure is slightly above international norms, but I think it's in line with probably what we should be spending in that area. The only time that obviously such spending becomes worrisome is the fact that we're also spending um, into areas where really just pouring money into a leaking bucket, such as the state-owned enterprises, etc. So our, our view, at least mine essentially, is that if we spent less money trying to compete with the private sector, if we gave less money to SAA. I mean, why have a national carrier in the first place? Mm. It's not really a socio-economic good. So if we weren't bleeding money in that area, we'd actually have even more money to finance the real socio-economic rights, such as access to housing, um, education, etc., and take ourselves away from trying to compete with the private sector. Yeah. All right. So if I had to ask you to sum up uh, our finance minister's budget, many people saying that he did the best in a very constrained environment. Would you agree or do you think he could have done better? I think he definitely could have done better. Yes. And what would you? What would be the one thing that you say he missed? He he really missed the mark on this one, and he could have done a much better job at. Well, cutting back on fiscal expenditure okay. and outlining a clear plan for economic growth. All right. So those are the those are the two issues that you feel yes. lacked uh, severely, and the aspect of job creation. Because at the end of the day, we've got to create those jobs because yes. people are desperate for jobs at the moment. Exactly. Thanks for talking to us. It's a pleasure. All right. Well, there you go. There's some interesting perspectives there from Gwen and Gwenya, the COO of the Institute of Race Relations. They're giving us their take on the budget speech that was delivered by our finance minister, Praveen Gordhan, and that was last week. All right. We take a break.